I'm Cynthia James, and this network is about changing lives one woman at a time. Hello, and welcome to Women Awakening. I'm your host, Cynthia James, and every week I get to bring to you another fabulous woman who's doing spectacular things on this planet, women who are change makers, women who have decided to take control of their lives and step into their authenticity and their power and bring their light to the planet. They are examples for you. It is so exciting. So uh, we do this every week. You can subscribe on iTunes, iHeart, Spreaker, Amazon, YouTube. Come back every week and meet a new woman. So today, I have a new friend that I want to introduce you to. Her name is Karen Elaine. She was born in Washington, D.C., but she was raised in the Bahamas. And she came to the U.S. when she was 12 and to attend a boarding school in Florida, right? She wanted to get a better education. She met and married the love of her life, Sean Means. They started a family with sons Christopher and Kellen and daughter Kelsey. And then she had a, a heartbreaking thing happen. She lost her son, Kenneth, Andrew, right? Also, she's battled breast cancer. She suffered a job loss. She's endured a lot of struggles, but it built her res resilience and helped her understand that she was a strong woman. So she started following her passion and she founded Emergent Soul in hopes that a community of people committed to bettering themselves could change the world. And then on the heels of Emergent Soul, she founded Emergent You, One Journey, One Life. This mind, body, spirit, and wellness publication allows participants to embark on a life that's the best life possible. So Karen, thank you so much for being here. Oh, th thank you so much for having me. I, I really enjoy what you're doing and you're offering women a platform to share their stories and connect. And I think that's beautiful. <laughs> well, it, it's definitely a passion for me. So I just want to talk a little bit about how you grew up because, you know, born in Washington and then in, in the Bahamas until you were 12. Talk to me a little bit about the family structure and how that was for you. Well, so my parents met at Howard University. Uh, my father's uh, from the Bahamas, uh, born and raised. And uh, after he finished dental school at Howard, um, his he said, we're moving to the Bahamas, moving back home. That was his desire. So uh, my mom, who was an American citizen, got to move to the Bahamas with uh, myself and my older sister. And um, I just started school there. So home is home. It's where you plant your roots. It's where you're siblings and everyone else's so I didn't I just grew up in the Bahamas so for me it was just normal <laughs> normal so um but part of my family's tradition my father's family tradition was to send the children to boarding school so at 12 uh, they found a boarding school for me to attend here in Florida my sister went to boarding school in Canada and it was just a way of making sure that we had a solid educational background and um as any parent they would want the best for their for their children so it yeah. was I can't say that I was ready to go away from home. I was just going to ask you that. <laughs> I was going to say, okay, how was that? Because you were 12. I was 12. Yeah. So the first, my first year, my mom told me she used to come up and see me every weekend because you can imagine most 12 year olds don't know how to do laundry. So she would come and see me and we would spend the whole weekend doing laundry because I would have a month's <laughs> worth of laundry just sitting there. And finally, she's like, I'm not doing this anymore. You need to learn how to take care of yourself. So I had a, I had a lot of first away from home, but it, I think it prepared me for later on in life, especially going to college. Um, I went to college at 16. And when most freshmen say they gained the freshman 15 and didn't know how to take care of themselves, I actually, I had four years of taking care of myself, learning to do a schedule and being responsible for myself. Um, I had to grow up quickly uh, in the sense that I was younger than a lot of other people in my class because I skipped, I skipped two grades. Um, not intentionally, but it happened intentionally because in the Bahamas, we're in the British system. So when I went to, to high school, I went to form, I had just finished form seven. So me not realizing that form seven is the equivalent to sixth grade in the U.S. So when I went to boarding school, I had just finished form seven. So they put me in the seventh grade and I was like, no, I just finished seven. I'm supposed to go in eight because logically it's 
six, seven, eight, you know, and they're like, okay, they never checked it. And they put me, <laughs> they just put me in the eighth grade. So I was able to keep up with my classmates educationally. I was just always younger, but uh, I really say it prepared me for later on in life, um, being responsible and taking care of myself at an early age. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, I, I'm very interested in this because um, my son is married to a woman and her whole family had the same tradition of kids going to boarding schools. But did you get lonely? Did, was it hard to learn, find community there? Well, actually, um, my first year I attended a boarding school in Orlando and I, I did not like it. It was in the middle of middle of Orlando, a not diverse place at all. And I was like, I was not happy. I cried and I was like, please bring me home. And I probably flew home every weekend. And then I transitioned to a boarding school in Boca Raton, Florida, where there were people from Freeport, which is where I grew up, also in that school. So I knew people. So I didn't feel as lonely. Uh, and some of the people who I knew from home, their parents also had second homes in Florida. So they would invite me to go with them on the weekend. But at that time, um, if I got lonely enough, I would call my dad. And I was young, like, Daddy, I need to come home. And all right, I'm sending you a ticket. And he would let me come home for the most part, whenever I wanted. Um, but it was it was different back then, I guess, back in the 80s, you know, not as diverse or people that looked like me in those type of places. But I just learned to to adapt and find my myself and make sure I did my studies. And then I was very involved in uh, sports at that time. So I found team community building and those type of things. How, how wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I want to talk about this period where there were challenges. I, I want to get to your your current work, but I, you know, okay. where there was the breast cancer and the losing of the, I mean, you know, what time frame was this and how are you navigating it? So I say, I mean, so I, I've actually been married twice and I'm actually divorced twice, <laughs> twice at this point. But my first marriage, I, I got married at uh, 25 and Christopher is from my first marriage and Kenneth was from my first marriage. And uh, Kenneth, um, both normal pregnancies, um, but my my son, I had just put him in daycare and two, three days later, he passed December 23rd of you know, me just going back to work. So that was a very, very trying time. Uh, and being a young mom, as well as a, a young wife, you know, we didn't, it, we didn't understand a lot. So our, my marriage didn't last at that time. And we broke apart. I met Sean two years later and had Kelsey and Kellen, you know, subsequently right away. Chris was six at the time. So it went from being not an only child, but a child by himself, the new mom, the new dad, and then two new siblings. And he, I remember him saying, mom, I love my brother and sister, but no more, please. <laughs> <laughs> he was used to just getting all of my attention. So everything quickly, but, um, so the, my loss of my son happened in my first marriage when I was 26. Okay. I, I got breast cancer when I was 39, actually on my 39th birthday, I was developed, developed breast, breast cancer. When I finished college, um, I went on and got my master's degree and I worked in medical medical sales. Um, I tell people I was a legalized drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I had an aunt on my father's side who had breast cancer and I had two aunts on my mother's side who had breast cancer. So being in the pharmaceutical sales industry, I had great insurance. And I told my doctor, I'm like, hey, I have insurance. Let me get a mammogram. Not, you know, so this is, I think I was a mid thirties. And he's like, you're not at high risk. Okay. He says I wasn't at high risk, but anyway, <laughs> um, I was like, I have insurance. So I just kept pushing, pushing, pushing. So not knowing why I, why I was pushing, that's actually gave me my baseline at 35, which is, which actually saved my life. So I, I had a mammogram at 35. And because at the time that physician was like, you're not at high risk because it's not your mother, not your sister. I had a mammogram, but not yearly or, you know, yearly. So after having four children and growing up, you know, the girls don't look the same anymore. And so I wanted to do something for myself. So I was like, all right, I'm going to have a reduction and a lift, a lift. Mm -hmm. So I found a physician in, 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 in my community and I had a reduction and a lift. So, um, going through different stages and I know I'm jumping here and there, but going through different stages in life, I had put on a lot of weight because I really, I wasn't happy or satisfied in my second marriage, <laughs> um, second marriage, I, but I put on a lot of weight. But anyway, when he did my reconstruction surgery, 
he made me a lot bigger than I was. I was never a heavy chested woman as a growing up. And I was like, you know, so I, I say that. So after I had my um, low reduction in lift, probably something clicked in my head. It's like, Karen, you know what? It's been a year and a half or so. You haven't had a mammogram. Go get a mammogram. So I went and had a mammogram and I was telling him at the same time, you know, I'm not really happy with my breasts. So he's like, come back in. We'll do a little bit of lipo. So on that appointment in office appointment, I had gone to him and I had just gone and had my mammogram. And I, and it's very important for you to go to the same place. So the radiologist is used to reading your films. And I said to him, I was like, you know, Dr. So-and-so, the radiologist, they, you know, they, they wanted, they're doing a comparison because they think they see something. And he was like, mm, don't worry about it. Normally when you have implants or anything like that, they can't, they don't know how to read it. So I was like, okay, I have a lot of degrees after my name, but MD wasn't one of them. So <laughs> you, you, you listen to your doctor. So I said, all right. So then shortly thereafter, my um, other doctor called me who was referring me to the mammograms. He's like, you know, Karen, they want to, they see something. They just want to do a biopsy, but don't worry about it. You're not high risk. So I said, okay. So I go and have the biopsy and I shared the appointment with the, the physician. And I said, you know what? My follow-up appointment is on my birthday. If it's anything serious, do me a favor. Just call me a day before, change the appointment. Don't allow me to come in on my birthday if you don't have good news. So we made a deal. We shook on it, actually. Perfect. So my follow-up appointment comes. I go to work. Everyone's like, do I need to go with you? I'm like, no. My husband at the time was working in Tampa because he was also in pharmaceutical as a manager. Everyone is away. I was fine going in. So I'm sitting there. And I remember. And he's, his back is to me, and he's looking at my chart. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. Happy birthday. Mm -hmm. And I'm smart. Cause I'm like, it's nothing. Cause we made a deal. And for me growing up, your word, every integrity is very important <laughs> and your word is very important. And then he turned around and he says, you have cancer. And I literally, I don't remember anything else. I don't remember what he said. The first thought was I should punch you in your face and I'm not a violent person. <laughs> But I was in shock, literally. And I was like, you broke your promise to me. We, we had a deal. So I remember leaving his office, going and sitting in my car. And I didn't know what to do because I didn't hear anything else. I called my, my husband at the time. He's four hours away. My kids at the time were, I think, four, five, and 10. And we always had little home parties. So I know they're at our house waiting for me to come home to celebrate my birthday. Oh, my God. Oh, my mom's in California. And I'm like, I have cancer. That's all I remember. So I had to drive myself home. The pictures on my birthday that day, they're sitting, I'm looking there. All the pictures that I have no, it's void in my face. Because now I'm like, I have cancer. It's my birthday. What's the next thing to do? You know, so I had to move forward. So I remember we didn't tell my kid children that I had cancer until I had to go have a PET scan. And because they're so young, you know, you, when you have a PET scan, that's full of radiation through your body. So no animals or small kids can come within like six feet of you for 24 hours. So that's when we told them then. And they're like, mommy, we don't want you. To. And then I decided to, I only had breast cancer on my left side. And my journey started after this. So that's why I'm sharing the story because I didn't find my voice until I was 40. <laughs> but breast cancer on my left side, which I later learned, at least through Louise Hayes, and I believe this as far as you can heal yourself, left cancer on your breast side is linked to unresolved grief. Yes. And exactly. that's right, which is I never got over losing my son, Kenneth. Right. Right. So I say that. So I opted to have a double mastectomy. Um, with with reconstruction, come to find out when I had the breath the reduction in lift in February of that year, the physician had they always send away tissue samples. So my tissue sample had come back suspicious at that time, and he never said anything. So had I not gone into the mammogram, which was my baseline, which is resolved, saved me. The guidelines at that time is like you don't start having mammograms till you're forty. So we don't know what would have happened. So at 40 is when I started to find my voice and really establishing my, I guess I say my spiritual journey. So a lot of things had happened when I was younger. I was uh, sexually molested when I was eight years old and I didn't tell anyone until I was 49. Yes. <laughs> it was someone that my family knew. My, I was a people pleaser. You know, my, my husband, second husband was 12 years older than me. And, and so 
I wasn't, we weren't, you know, I don't begrudge him. He gave me two beautiful children who we, you know, still stay in touch with now, but whatever he said went, didn't matter if I agreed or not. I did it. It was one day I was talking to my sister-in-law at the time and she's like, Karen, you know, you could say no. And it was like a light bulb popped on. Mm -hmm. I can say no. I didn't start saying no until I was 40, (laughs) but I started going on that spiritual journey and path to find emergent soul. And it's really my belief that my son Kenneth put this into my spirit because even the definition emergent is the process of coming into being and soul gives life to the body. It was me finding myself, my voice. And that was how everything got started. Well, (laughs) what's uh, this story is just, it's got so many layers and, uh, and it's very powerful but first of all, I just want to acknowledge you're listening to your intuition, even though you may not have known that's what you were listening to. You kept mm-hmm. persisting to all be right. tested. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and by the way, I do want to say when the doctor didn't keep his word, you did speak it. I did. That, that he broke his <laughs> word, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Thank and, you. And, and the other thing is, is like the acknowledgement that that souls transition from the physical, but they're still operating in other realms. And so the fact that you think Kenneth sent this to you Mm -hmm. is such a gift and, and that um, you finally found your voice. That's my hope. My whole new book is about that, but you found your voice Mm -hmm. to, to speak about, what had happened to you as a child and to start to understand that no is a complete sentence and you can, you can bring it. So I want to know how you got into publishing and, 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 and how you started bringing emergent soul to the world. Okay. Uh, So thank you. So um, in 2009, Sean got displaced from his career as a district manager in pharmaceutical sales and uh, as I said, he he was, I think he was 50 at the time, which is not old, <laughs> but there is age ageism in corporate America. And he could not find another position. So he uh, became a franchise broker. And, you know, he found this new publication called Her Life Magazine. And basically Her Life Magazine was uh, a, I'll call it, it was presented as an all-in-one. You don't have to know anything about publishing. You sell. And as salespeople, we sell, you know, we excel at selling. So it was a woman's publication out of Kansas City. And he's like, Karen, you know, I think this is a business that we can do a part A for me and a plan B for you. I never in my life saw myself as a publisher or, or media or anything like that. I just never did. But I talked to the, the prior owner at the time and I said, okay, well, tell me about the publication. Tell me what, you know, what it, you know, about it. And if this is something that could work in the South Florida market and who you look, you know, what are the qualifications of franchise owners? And so it, it, it clicked it. And I was like, okay. And I had never even thought of myself as an entrepreneur at that time, really an entrepreneur. I, I mean, I've, I've sold real estate, but never I've always worked in corporate America, but anyway, so we we looked at it as a business model. Um, I thought that it was something that could work in the South Florida market. I, and, and I'm smiling because uh, Sean and I were talking about the structuring of our company and everything. And I had remember I started speaking up at that time. So he was like, "Well, if you want to be the boss, you pay for it yourself." Hmm. Okay, so I did. <laughs> I bought the front, the, the Florida market myself. And so it was set up as a business as, okay, Sean, you'll build a sales team. I'll be the head of the company as it's a woman's publication. And let's see what happens. And it was, I thought it was good in the sense where it could compete in the marketplace. And I knew nothing about publishing um, in the marketplace because it, it could feature local women. So the magazines that you see, you know, in your area have models on the cover and they're glassy. And I was like, you know what, this could be an opportunity to put local women who might not necessarily get an opportunity to be on the cover, women of color being on the cover. 
You know, we have judges, we have uh, Gloria Diaz, who was the person who came out with the $4 prescription plan for Walmart, just different women. I was like, I, that's what excited me. I knew the only thing that we had to come up with is that they provided the content for the most part. I knew photographers because my two youngest children modeled and I called them, hey, I'm doing magazine. Do you want to be my <laughs> photographers? And we move forward. So it's a little bit of naivete in that, but we move forward. So I remember our first publication, I didn't go to the, I found a local printer, we printed all magazines and I went to the, didn't go to the print run. My oldest son was in high school and I remember the printer call, calling me that afternoon and he's like, Karen, we just print off 20,000 covers, copies of your cover and there's a mistake. And I'm saying to myself, oh Lord, you had to print off 20,000 copies before you realized that there was a mistake. And then I'm hearing, okay, that cost da, 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 da. I'm like, oh my God, I'm freaking out. So I drive down there and I call the publisher in Kansas City who we had uploaded our magazine and they proofed it because I knew nothing about publishing. And they said, you don't have to know anything. They're going to do it all. We just send them proofs and pictures. And she said, you're the editor in chief. <laughs> you're the publisher. It's your magazine. And I'm like, but wait a minute. I don't know anything about CMYK RBG files and all this stuff. I had known nothing. Yeah, but you're the editor in chief. So I was like, hmm, okay. So it was a light bulb that if you're going to have this product, you have to learn. So then I had to learn about publishing and proofreading and going through. So I learned, I was thrown, in, <laughs> thrown into Max. But for three years, uh, Sean did sales and I went out a little bit because you know for the magazine and then when I I eventually got laid off in 2012 couldn't find another job and, and it wasn't a matter of performance it was it's economic financials and Sean had said to me Karen it's not a matter of if you're going to get laid off it's a matter of when because unfortunately you earn too much money mm -hmm. I was the only person of especially salesperson in Palm Beach County with my company only after I was a district trainer everything and because I excelled in selling <laughs> When they saw it, said they had, didn't have a position, I literally thought I was going to have a heart attack. I was like, what? But I went to work for myself at that point. Now, so that's how I got into publishing. Now, how Emergent Soul came about is that when I turned 40, it was like the skies opened my mind, everything, intuition. I learned about intuition. I learned about, you know, chakras and pendulums and the universe. And it just, and it fascinated me. So I started going to different workshops. And I remember going to a women's empowerment workshop and I was sitting, they were talking about different businesses. And I was like, oh, I have something inside of me. I don't know what it is. And it's going to be called emergent soul. And I'm like, emergent, is that even a word? That doesn't even sound like a real word, but didn't know what it was. I went to a, another workshop in Boston and we um, the exercise, it was a forgiveness exercise. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's, mm -hmm. you tell a story of two minutes of the person who you feel hurt you the most and they have to be alive. And um, I was like, oh, it's my first husband, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And so you tell the story of how they hurt you the most. And of course, it, for me, it was the unresolved issue of my, our son passing away and then 30 days, him walking out, right? So, right. And then after you tell that story, you have a partner, you tell that for two minutes. And then the next two minutes, you tell the same story, but from their perspective. Mm. And I sat there and I was like, I, I didn't, I didn't do anything. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and the professor was like, no, the coach leader, she's like, no, Karen, tell the story from their perspective on how they, you know, what happened. So I, I was like, okay. So he told, so the first two minutes I was like, you know, he left me at the time I needed him most. I didn't want to love. We had our two-year-old son. I can't believe he left me. It caught me by surprise. He was seeing with someone else. I had no clue. Da, 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 da. She's like, all right, now tell the story from his perspective on why he left. So I, I was like, all right, I don't know. So I said, okay, well, he told me that if I shopped, he was going to leave me. She's like, he told you that? I said, no, of course not. I'm making it up because I have no idea what I did to contribute to this situation, not realizing that's keeping me in victim mode, but we learn. So she said, okay, that's your story. Then the next two minutes, you tell the story from how you've done the same thing to somebody else. When I tell you, Cynthia, <laughs> they probably thought someone was killing me <laughs> because this gut-wrenching crying just came out of me as far because the story that I had been telling myself is that 
when I needed somebody them the most, they weren't there for me. So I really had abandonment issues. But what came up out of me and where I just broke, I'll just say broke open was the realization is that where I did the same thing to somebody else, I've been doing it to myself. Yes. 40 years. Yeah. So I, what you just said is so important because a lot of times when we're in that state of being a victim, we, we don't even see our participation in it. We, we don't see what we're doing to ourselves or what we've done to others. Mm -hmm. And so what a, what a beautiful process that woman took you through, you know, at a time when there was a lot going on, you were learning to be an entrepreneur. And I'm assuming that the marriage wasn't as, as glowing and fabulous as you would have wanted. No. And so, and so did you start Emergent Soul while you were still doing the, the publishing of the magazine or, or did, was it on its own? Yes. So yes, it came through. So as media, I would get invited to a little a lot of events and I would go. And then at one of the events I went to and I was like, something is coming through and it was Emergent Soul. So at, for all of a sudden, they're like, you know what? I'm going to have a women's conference because I know I love to support women. I know that, you know, we have a lot to give and I'm like, I'm gonna have a women's conference. And so at this conference, uh, Infusionsoft was there. And I remember uh, Tony, he's like, Karen, if when's your next conference? Cause we love what you're saying and we'll be your sponsor. We're gonna be your major sponsor. So I literally picked three days, six months away and I got them to be a sponsor. I had never put a conference together before, knew nothing. So that's how Emergent Soul got started. And it, for me, it was like Emergent, you know, I guess King Emergent, the process of coming and being, to soul gives light to the body, you know, what defines all of us. It was just like this, what defines all of us, you know, what happens to you doesn't define you. Stop being, stop hiding, start sharing your stories with others because we're not alone. And all these things, and I was like, yes, this is the community that I want to build. And so that's how Emergent Soul was birthed. Now, the morning of the conference, when I got up to speak, is when I connected as far as my son and the message that was bringing forth because I was practicing, you know, my speech and I was saying, and then I was like, yes, you know, what happens to you doesn't define who you are. You know, you know, you don't have to hide. And it was, I was talking to myself, not realizing it. And then finally I was like, come the process of coming into being. And it was all the things that had happened to me, my journey through is who I am. And it's not a, a destination. It's the journey because we're still every day we learn and grow. So it was my process of uncovering the layers, stop hiding who I was to find myself. So that was the process of my coming into being. And it was me giving back to myself because I always tended to neglect myself. I would give, give, give almost to my detriment. And I was like, you know what I said? I, I was my, it's my belief that my son gave me this gift to help find myself because he is I believe he's with me in spirit, you know, and so that's how it started. And so I started, you know, having conferences, of course, is all pre-COVID, <laughs> you know, but having women's conferences, I went on and got my, you know, certified life coach and started helping women and different things. And, you know, saying that, you know, we have to stop hiding. And there were so many different levels on a health basis growing up in the Caribbean, as far as being, you know, West Indian, African-American and, parents of the in the 40s, you don't, and their parents, they didn't talk about, oh, grandmama had sweet sugar. Well, what is that? It's diabetes. Start taking care of your health, being your own advocate, understanding the disparities in health care for people of color and, and our, you know, our minority sisters, when I, I'm our majority sisters, when I was uh, developed with breast cancer, I went to a breast cancer group for women of color. And then I went to a breast cancer group for women under 50. My women under 50 group happened to be, I was the only black person there. And I would go there and they're like, yes, did you know that you can get bras for free? I didn't know this. And I would go back to the African-American group and I'm like, did you guys know that you can get bras for free? Go to the white group. Did you know that when you're diagnosed that your insurance company will pay for something, a nurse navigator, because you don't really know what's going on and she'll be there sitting next to you and taking notes so you can remember? I didn't have that. I had great insurance. And I would go back to them. Did you guys wear, wear this? And I was like, what is going on? Why is this happening? And so I'd start speaking up about it and saying, you know, hey, be your own advocate. Demand equality in health care because we're paying the same premiums for the most part. Get the services that you're entitled to. 
you know, yeah. understanding that getting laid off my job, that crushed me, but understanding that, you know, hey, it doesn't define who you are. Look at you. You're an entrepreneur. You went out and sold millions of dollars for these companies and pharmaceutical sales. Now you're doing it from something else. But just learning and putting it full circle of that, you know, and, and I'm, I do excel in sales that for me, selling is not transactional. It can be transformational, but it's about a being, it's about being of service and building strong relationships. And for being a woman who had, you know, had two marriages and my oldest, my husband being 12 years older than me in the second saying, okay, you need to know about finances. You need to know about this and these things, because if you're actually, if we say that we're an independent, being an independent woman doesn't mean that you don't need a partner or a mate, but it's being educated enough, sorry, educated enough where you can help make sound decisions and be involved and utilizing your voice. So I'm like, okay, these are important things. And so being in relationships where I had given away my power and then trying to regain my power to be, you know, to, to build myself up and not even you know, you edify your mate and it has nothing to do with taking away their power. But I said, these are important characteristics to help other women to see that also. And so that's how Emergent Soul came together and why I think it's important. And the most important thing I think is sharing of, of your stories of what happened to you for others to know, hey, I'm I'm not alone. And breaking down does is sometimes where you find your breakthrough. Exactly, I exactly. Do it, I can do it, and that's that's what it's about. <laughs> well, how do people find you? How how do people find your work? Well, thank you. So my website is uh, emergentsoul.com. On social media, Facebook and Instagram, it's the Emergent Soul, and Twitter. And on YouTube, it's Emergent Soul Conversations, where I also have a, po- a podcast for people, um, where people come on my show. And Cynthia, I'd love to have you on my show also, but mm-hmm. share their stories uh, about women doing great things and inspiring others to do the same. Well, well, I, I'd be honored. And I, uh, it's so exciting to hear your story and what you've moved through and how you learn to stand in your own power and find your own voice. So I ask... Um, my guest, the same last question. The show is called Women Awakening. What do you think is the most important thing about women awakening on the planet in this moment? Mm. In this moment, it's definitely, it's being community. And Mm. how do you be in community is that you're building strong relationships and lending a hand and then helping someone up, helping someone come up. That, that's what I think is very important right now in this time uh, where we're, the world is a different place right now. <laughs> it's, it's very different, but it needs healing and love and it's true community and, and sisterhood. Yeah. So that's what I think it is. It's beautiful. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing your gifts. Thank you for stepping out in, in moments where you weren't unsure and but part of you knew that the net would appear. So thank you so much. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been wonderful. (laughs) So ladies, uh, I'm going to say to you the same thing I say every week in different forms. It it is really important that you remember that you matter. It's really important that you remember that you're essential on this, in your family, in your business, in your life that you are a masterpiece that is unfolding and that you get to contribute to the transformation of this planet by bringing your voice, by standing in your power, by shining your light, by risking, by daring to take a leap of faith. So I'm grateful to know you. I'm grateful to serve you. You can go to CynthiaJames.net if you want other resources of support, but please know that I hold you in high regard. And I do this podcast because I want women to remember who we are. Much love and I'll see you soon. 